Greetings from Fin Study Club. My name is Ankur Kulsrisht. Welcoming all viewers to a very interesting session on indirect method of preparing cash flow uh, from operations. This is a very very critical topic from an exam point of view, and we should expect at least a couple of questions in the uh, you know exam for uh, the morning attempt as well as in the afternoon attempt. Technically, this is part of your 27th reading of financial reporting and analysis. Before getting into the details of this indirect method, I hope and uh, would appreciate if the users have already looked at the overview and the video which covered the direct method. Because until and unless we are absolutely sure what is direct, we will not be in a position to appreciate what do we mean by indirect because that's going to be exactly opposite of it so uh, you know with this suggestion in mind uh, let us start the indirect method now before getting on to the indirect method it will be very very imperative for me to you know contextually explain what we used to do in the direct method and since you have looked at the video therefore you know it will be all the more easier for me you would remember that under the direct method we always used to select what we need. What I mean to say is there was a clean slate and someone asked you to draw CFO here. So, you know, you can start from wherever you want. You can write what you want. Uh, you know, you can put things wherever you want. So the point, the keyword which is coming out is want, select. That means to say that there is a long list out of which you are going to go one by one as a roll call and you are going to select the operational stuff cash collection from customer cash payment to suppliers taxes paid uh, you know under the us gap interest expenses paid etc etc so the i the the methodology there was selection uh, of whatever we wanted but it has got a little problem and the little problem is that it is too mundane and hard work oriented what I'm trying to say is, let's say any company which has got 100 transactions would have 95 operational transactions and only 5% of financing and investing. I mean, that's basically the differentiation based on the nature of each category. You know, how many new machineries can you buy? How many times can you structure a loan, etc. So the point is, day-to-day -day operational activities are very far too many compared in comparison with the financing and the investing activity there is a problem now if let's say out of the 100 transactions i need to segregate 95 and those five doesn't it make better sense to select these five ones and then exclude them so as to uh, you know leave 95 untouched in the same room where you know initially 100 people were sitting and now i have asked these five gentlemen to please go out of room to exclude them from where their status quo was this is the pedagogy of indirect method where we really do not start with a clean slate we we start with a very close proxy we start with a very close proxy so we are basically trying to say here is that Unlike the direct method, there is always a starting point available for us, which is a very, very close equivalent of CFO. So I'm going to write a small equation where my PAT is almost like termed as equivalent to CFO. However, I understand that there are two problems with PAT and which doesn't make it equal to CFO. The first problem is the problem of accrual. Obviously, it is part of income statement, which is based on the accrual principle. Accrual as in you give importance to happening of things rather than the cash flow. The other problem is the problem of comprehensiveness. By this, I mean that it will include operating plus financing plus investing all types of incomes. Whereas in case of CFO, uh, all I need is your uh, operating. So uh, all I'm trying to do right now is this PAT, which is a good starting point. Uh, I don't have a clean slate. I have a starting point. I'm going to make four small adjustments. Adjustment number one, two, three and four. And the intent of these four adjustments is to 
correct or to purify uh, this figure of pad and convert it into CFO. So I am standing at point A, I need to go to point B rather than going in a direct manner. I am trying to go to the same point in a very, very indirect manner, indirect manner uh, because purely because of convenience from the accountant's point of view. So I have, you know, uh, made a very, very point categorically that the method is very, very convenient from an accountant point of view. Uh, but, you know, from a reader point of view, it's a very, very bad method. And I'm going to come back to that using a particular example. Now, so here, the four adjustments that we need to do is let's take one by one. And you got to remember that there are two problems that we have to solve. The problem number one is of accrual and problem number two is of comprehensiveness. The problem of accrual is solved by step one and step four. In step one, we upfront exclude the items which are present in PAT, obviously income and expenses, which are of non-cash nature. By this I mean is, let's say there is an expense like depreciation because of which my profit after tax has gone down, but actually my cash flow hasn't happened. Uh, therefore, this deduction is unwarranted to exclude exclude the impact I'm coming to my pedagogy to exclude what I don't need I'm going to nullify the previous uh, you know action and therefore I will add back my non-cash expenses so if you look at the signs here carefully incomes have been deducted and expenses have been added actually I am not including here I am not including these items here. Inclusion would have your general sign, but I am actually excluding here. So excluding will always be in a reverse direction, therefore this opposite sign. Once the initial non-cash items are removed, then uh, whatever items are left, I go to convert them from an accrual counterpart to a cash counterpart. And this I'm going to explain, you know, while I will do uh, the practical example, which is on my next page. Uh, so, you know, we got to just keep patience on step four. Coming to the second problem of comprehensiveness, step two takes care of that, which basically says that I'm going to exclude any financing and investing activity, should there be any, like loss on sale of assets or, you know, premium paid on redemption of debentures or you know gain on uh, or loss on retirement of debt now all these are financing items or investing items you know for me they are basically non operating item my focus is always operating therefore i'm going to remove them now coming to the third part you know actually this third part could have been avoided also uh, because tax provision like any other non cash expense is added and since us gap says all types of taxes paid are shown out of cfo hence the actual tax payment has been deducted the importance of uh, you know the, the, the reason for giving a specific importance to this adjustment is because you also have deferred tax assets and liabilities in your course uh, you know where this step is going to be you know particularly very very uh, important so i really don't want to you know smudge these into the other three and want to keep this as as a specific point so uh, i'm sure that you know without doing an example the understanding will not be uh, you know very strong uh, let's start a very very simple example of cfo by the indirect method wherein i have taken an income statement which has got a top line of 45 cogs of 30 and different expenses and the corresponding balance sheet excerpts excerpts as in this is not a complete balance sheet it is just your you know, the required accounts that I need for, you know, uh, my treatment of PAT into CFO. So I'm going to follow my steps very, very strictly. And my starting point is given right here, which is your PAT. So my profit after tax is equal to 5400, which is my starting point. Uh, after which I'm going to do my first adjustment, which is of non cash items. Now this non cash adjustment is uh, by this what I'm trying to say is there are actually one two three four five six seven eight eight people sitting in a room called income statement the final output of which is 5400 in this 5400 there are various people uh, which are non-cash by nature uh, if I were to select which is point number four point number five 
and point number seven even the preliminary expenses amortized are non-cash so uh, i'm going to tell these gentlemen that boss your role in calculating income statement has been well appreciated but now i am cal undergoing my journey for cfo and therefore i don't need your help thank you very much i am going to exclude them so uh, in a way i am adding back 500 i am adding back 1500 and i am adding back 1800 so in all i have added back 3800 dollars uh, of adjustment uh, as non cash items had there been an income it is only a matter of chance that everything is an expense here but had there been an income here i would have deducted it accordingly so that's my step 1 for you my step 2 is plus or minus of non operating items now point to be noted out of 8 3 have already gone so i'm my focus point is only the balance 5 number 1 point number 2 point is these non operating items i am not saying these are non cash all I'm saying is these are either finance or investment. So they will appear in my cash flow statement. I'm not denying the fact, but not under operating. Okay. So here uh, I am going to take care of them very, very carefully. Uh, and again, start reading. Sales is operating. COGS is operating. Salary is operating. But loss on sale of uh, furniture that is a financing item this loss has resulted into a fall a downward pressure on this PAT hence I am going to add back point to be noted here is that each of the items is actually on accrual basis now this is where a lot of people get confused so while we are doing adjustment number one um, we are not trying to remove everything all we are trying to say is we got to exclude items which by nature are non-cash let me explain it says that sales is actually on accrual basis means to say it will include some of the credit portion as well but you know someday somewhere maybe today after two months of credit period you will get cash so you know I can find out the cash counterpart and that is exactly the reason for my working capital adjustment which I'm going to come back to you uh, but the, the, the take for point number one is so in my point one, I'm going to uh, not look at the accrual aspect. That is something I'm going to look at point number four. I'm going to select the items which are by nature uh, non-cash, like depreciation, like preliminary expenses written off. Because not today, but even after five years also, you will not be required to pay cash to anyone uh, because of these items. However, if you look at COGS, uh, maybe today this is all accrual, but let's say, you know, after three months, you might have to pay to your supplier. So um, all I'm trying to say is this has a cash counterpart, uh, whereas the point number four, five and seven don't have a cash counterpart at all. And those are the things that I got to exclude it here. So after doing step two, I am with step three, wherein we got to do the tax adjustment and uh, you know, in the tax adjustment, I'm going to add back the tax provision made because this is a non-cash item and I have to deduct the actual taxes paid. The actual tax paid, which is which needs to be calculated in a working note sort of thing, uh, which I'm going to do here. It says that uh, I'm going to combine the balance sheet account for this, which is right here. Um, it says that at the beginning of the year I already have an advance tax of uh, 22,100 and let us assume I have paid X more which means to say this is my total money lying with the government out of which the government says your current year's liability is 3600 and uh, the balance payment which is still with them is 20,100 all those who are commerce graduate can very quickly make an account for advance tax and they can write opening balance, they can write closing balance, they can write cash paid and the provision. So, you know, this is the equation that I've tried to form is basically a substitute for making a ledger account, which is more like a commerce thing, but you know, still nonetheless, not very difficult. So I would urge students to, you know, uh, create this logical thinking because it will also be required uh, 
in my next session where I'm going to convert or should I say try to bridge the gap between the indirect method to the direct method. So by doing a quick match, my x is um, coming as equal to 1600 um, because this and this is minus 2000 and yeah, therefore 1600. Your advance tax paid is minus 1600. The net adjustment is plus 2000. Minus 3600 plus uh, plus 3600 minus 1600 is net plus 2000. Now this has also been treated. So therefore, the portions or should I say the members who are unattended are member number one, two, three, and that's about it. So now for one, two, and three, uh, these are the items which are A, in cash, B, uh, in operating as well. So I go to now find their cash counterparts, uh, you know, uh, which I'm going to explain uh, by in, in the session called conversion of indirect into direct and here what I'm going to do is as a shortcut I'm going to look at the corresponding balance sheet items uh, of uh, sales so which is let's say account receivable your sales is uh, credit sales which is related to account receivable so all I'm going to do is uh, debtor in my case is going up by 1300 which I am going to Let's look at increase in current assets needs to be deducted. Uh, let's look at the maths first. I'm going to explain the logic. I am going to deduct 1300. The reason for that is now you got to understand that I will explain it in two manners. A is equal to L plus C. If your debtor goes up and what should be the sign on the cash counterpart? The only way the equation can tally is when the cash will go down. In other way, I'm only trying to say is that your debtors are, or should I say any other asset, are inversely related to the cash. Okay. Let's look at the liability part, which is the salary accrued, which is the outstanding expenses. So I'm going to connect this circle with outstanding expenses. And this outstanding expenses as a current liability is going up by 800. 800 I will add again if the liability goes up if the liability goes up the cash needs to come up uh, so that the equation can tally so that's the mathematical logic of it let me try and understand in, in, a, in a more logical construct just you know appreciate this fact that if the outstanding expenses are going up by $800 that means lower payment would have happened only then more people uh, are now in queue to take payment from us only then the outstanding amount will go up i'm assuming that none of the 4600 have been paid more so 800 during the year have also been paid less than what they should be um, than what they should be and therefore i would imagine that the cash payment is actually only 1200 but you know i am not going to find 1200 i am uh, i already have 2000 written in this 5400 which i am going to adjust as uh, plus 800 so the net impact this there is a minus 2000 included already in this 54 and I have given a plus 800 impact here so the net impact of the two is uh, minus 1200 which is exactly the payment that I was talking about logically let's try and get to the debtor uh, thing which is if debtors are going up that means during the year there are some people uh, who haven't paid us that means the cash collection which should have happened have not happened which means lesser collection which means or should I say deemed equal to uh, cash payment so we are basically using a negative sign for all deemed cash outflows or you know lesser cash inflows if the debtor goes up that means the people whom uh, you know you have to receive something they are increasing that means you might not have received from them this year that means you know the cash is collection hasn't happened and that means you know lower cash and therefore negative sign so by doing this I have you know adjusted for sales I have adjusted for salary accrued the only thing adjusted is COGS which is a matter of your uh, creditor and your stocks let me clean the board for you and arrive at a very very interesting calculation of cash payment to suppliers and actually I am going to use stocks 
which is going down by thousand uh, which is a good news for me one thousand and my creditors going up which is also a good news for me uh, which is here so overall the net of all these is plus 700 which is uh, 1200 yeah plus 700 and uh, therefore the overall if I were to summarize the question now I have minus 1500 minus 5400 as the starting point in which step 1 uh, I have done as plus 3800 as a step 2 I have done plus 200 which makes it plus 4000 plus 2000 which makes it plus 6000 and plus 6700 so overall your CFO is coming out to be uh, plus 6700 twelve thousand one hundred dollars so while the accrual counterpart is fifty four hundred let me go back while the accrual counterpart here is fifty four hundred my cash counterpart is twelve thousand one hundred and this journey is possible only because of one two three four uh, adjustments so there is a lot more to you know explain and uh, you know uh, make you understand in in case of indirect method there is a very very interesting uh, you know session coming which we will try and bridge the gap between the direct and the indirect method by creating a logical construct between the two i will just like to end this session by asking few questions if this is a cash flow statement i want to know how much is a cash collection from the customers just look at this and if this is giving you the final cash flow it must give you the interim cash flows as well so uh, can you tell me how much is a cash collection from customer well the answer is no can you tell me how much is cash payment to suppliers well the answer is no can you tell me how much is the actual salary paid I know mathematically you can but on the face of it you cannot therefore we conclude that it's a very very bad method to read although it's very convenient for an accountant to make but it's a very very bad method to uh, read uh, or analyze for the uh, you know uh, the investor the whole genesis of making cash flow statement is not to uh, look at the incomes for that i have income statement is not to look at assets for that i have balance sheet but to look at cash flows cash flow statement is prepared to look at cash flows i mean what kind of an x-ray is that if i can't look at the bones i mean the, the short point here is your indirect method is really a shortcut which should not be followed uh, very often but generally you know is 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 followed because of the convenience although my us gap and ifr has very very categorically have said that they do not prefer this method but they do not uh, you know uh, regulate it as as much as to you know kind of cancel it they just give out a preference for uh, direct method but they don't neglect indirect method completely therefore you know convenience rules the show and uh, that brings us to the end of this very very you know uh, interesting and uh, important session i hope that you like the uh, recording and uh, would be very very happy to receive any kind of query question feedback should you have any at finstudyclub at gmail.com in case uh, you have any questions uh, feel free to write us look forward to speak to you in my next session this was ankur kulshresht from finstudy club thank you